much. So we already went through renewing your mind toward the problems you have, renewing your mind toward the relationships you have, and renewing your mind on handling change in your life. And today, I want to talk about stress. Renew your mind about stress. Sometimes situations hit us like a tsunami, and they create a great deal of potential stress for us. And we all react in different ways. I like this story that I've told you, I think, before about a husband and a wife who, um, the husband got really sick and they went to the doctors and in the office he examined the husband, shaking his head, finally asked the husband to step out and he said to the wife, listen, uh, if, you, if you're going to save the life of your husband, it's, it's because of stress, this disease, you've got to take all the stress off him. You've got to, every evening, you've got to, draw him a, a nice hot bath, you've got to rub his back, you've got to do everything that he wants you to do, you've got to cook him exactly what he likes and bring it to him and serve him and take all the stress off. And if you do that for six months, maybe to a year, he'll probably live. And so she said, wow, doc, thank you. And she went out to her husband in the waiting room and the, and the husband said, so what did the doctor say? She said, you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we all handle stress differently. <laughs> we all have different reactions to it. And so I want us to renew our mind, our thinking about stress with this, answering this question, how do you lower your stress level? I just watched a documentary on television about Katrina blowing in on New Orleans and the mayor of New Orleans, after Katrina came, was so overwhelmed, he checked out, he zoned out, he didn't do, he couldn't do anything. He was kind of uh, stunned. Stress can do that sometime, and whether you are the mayor of the town, or whether you're a housewife, or a teenager with school, maybe you're a husband, or you're, you're a machinist, a policeman, whatever, whatever, however you function in life, we are susceptible to stress but I want to say something really important here. Stress is not something that's caused by something on the outside. Stress is caused by something on the inside. It's a big statement, isn't it? We could blame our circumstances around us for how we're feeling so stressed out, but it is not really our circumstances' fault. You could have the same two people in the same situation and one is cool, calm, and collected and just keeps being productive and the other falls to people and goes to his, falls to pieces and goes to hysterics. It's not on the outside. Stress is a response on the inside. It's a response of the mind. It's how we're reacting, how we're thinking about something. So we want to renew our mind toward the potential stressful situations in our lives. If I suddenly told you, you know, I got a news flash, you know, I pulled out my phone and it was on the phone, we're going to get hit by a nuclear warhead in five minutes. Some of you would go crazy. Ah, oh, we're going to get, we're going to die. Others would turn to your spouse and say, sweetheart, I love you. It's been nice knowing you. I'll see you on the other side. Others, you, other... <laughs> Others of you would turn to your spouse and say, finally, we're out of here. We're done. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say those kinds of things. But stress is a combination of worry and guilt and tension and bitterness and anger. Uh, all of those things. And what we want to answer today is how could we handle them better? How could we have these difficult situations, these tsunamis blow into our lives, which potentially can cause such crippling stress? How could we, with our renewed thinking, how can we handle this better? The Bible says in 2 Timothy 4 and 5, it says, keep your head in all situations. And then in New Living Translation, keep a clear mind in every situation. Now that Greek word means stay sober. In other words, when stress is hitting you, don't go out and get drunk. Uh, and we laugh, but some people do that. They bury their problems with, by just, just, just trying to like an ostrich, bury their head. And so literally that means stay sober. But figuratively it means don't get all wrapped up and confused. 
Stay self-controlled in your mind. Be clear-headed. Be self-possessed. Don't fall to pieces. This was Paul telling Timothy this when he was going to start a church. He was telling him as a pastor. My paraphrase is, listen, when stressful situations come to you, don't weird out. Don't twink out. It's all right. It's all right. The stress isn't caused by out there. The stress is caused by in here. So let's look at three common challenging situations to us that could cause us a great deal of stress. First of all, compromising situations. The pressure's on sometimes when the crowd is going in a certain way and encouraging us or chanting to us or telling us to do what they're doing. That could be very stressful as a teenager. Why don't you smoke this cigarette? Why don't you take this drink? Uh, on a test, why don't you cheat? For a businessman, gee, you know, do I go with the profit or do I go with the people? I, I should do right by the people, but boy, I can make a lot of profit here. Challenging. For a salesman, should I tell the truth and probably lose the sale or should I, should I lie and probably get the sale? There's these challenges of compromising our situation in life. We face them every week, these moral, these ethical decisions, really. I was, in my younger days, newly saved, and uh, my friend was getting married, and he had a bachelor's party, which I attended down in New Orleans. And it was a big room, and um, he was a good friend of mine, but I was standing in the back trying to be low-key. I was a Christian now. Everybody was, you know, bachelor parties, everything. And uh, there was a big stage up there, and at one point... This, my friend, who was going to get married, stood up on the stage, and somebody came with the bright idea that somebody was going to have a race to see who could drink this big beer, this chug this beer faster, him or whoever, you know, was going to be competing against him. And all of a sudden, my name comes up, and everybody in the room is chanting my name. I'm saying, no, no, no. no. When I got saved, I made a a decision, I saw the damage and the harm in alcohol, and I made a decision, I am not going to touch that stuff. And, but they're chanting me, and they come and they carry me up there. And they put me down on the stage. And I'm standing there facing my friend, who puts a, hand, a beer in my hand, a big mug thing, and everybody's, go, go, go. I mean, you've never been there probably, but I was there. I was there, new Christian. <laughs> Compromising situation. I don't think I'll tell you the end of that story. Well, maybe I will. Maybe I will. <laughs> because there's two things you can do to reduce the stress that may come in compromising situations. And the first one is this. When you are stressed by a potential, by a compromise, that you're tempted to compromise, do the right thing. And I'm so glad I can't probably tell you all my testimonies that don't turn out this good, but I put the beer down and said, I can't do this. And although people were disappointed, I walked away without stress. Because here's the thing. Sometimes those peer pressure situations can give you short-term stress, and you could relieve that stress by doing the wrong thing, the unethical thing, by leaving your integrity on the side and just giving into the crowd. But the better thing, the, the, the long-term solution, is to do the right thing and head for the long-term solution. Because long after you have pleased the crowd, you'll be living with guilt and fear and skeletons in the closet and thinking somebody might find this out and, oh no, what if they find this? You'll have stress for the rest of your life when you lose your integrity and you do what's wrong. But if you do what's right, you'll have a short-term stress, but it'll be over, and long-term, you won't have the stress. You with me? I... Oh, man, you're going to think I'm really something with these testimonies. But anyway, when I, before I was a Christian, I worked <laughs> in this bar kind of place, all this stuff. And, and I, I didn't do right. I thought I was owed more than I was given. And, um, you know, I probably I shouldn't have done this, but I took some things that didn't belong to me. When I, when I wasn't a Christian and I was, uh, you know, hungry for funding... <laughs> 
And I was the manager, and then I got saved, and it bothered me. And I went back to the owner. I found him, and I paid him back with interest. I apologized. I told him I was sorry, and he was so gracious. He actually gave, me, gave, me, gave it all back to me. Yeah, that was really awesome. He could have sent me to jail or prison or whatever. But anyway, I'm here today and I'm not in prison. Thank the Lord. His grace is sufficient for us. But what I'm saying is really the short term. To relieve the stress in the short term, you have to live with that guilt. By, when you compromise your life, when you compromise your integrity, you've got to live with that guilt the rest of your life. Whereas if you just do the right thing, yeah, maybe the crowd would be like looking at you like, you're not going to drink? You're not going to race them with chugging the beer? Sorry, I'm not. I got down and I, well, everybody's disappointed, but I walked out of there clean. And I live, and I'm telling you that today, I'm living clean, long-term forgotten. I'm not worried about a skeleton in my closet. I'm not worried about all that kind of stuff. I'm living clean. And that is a much better place to live in as far as stress is concerned. You see, the way the devil works is this. He wants you to be miserable. So before you do this thing, what does he tell you? Nobody's looking. Everybody's doing it. Nobody's going to know. Nobody will ever find out. And then as soon as you do it, what does he tell you? Everybody's going to find out. That's exactly what he says. Beforehand, nobody's going to find out. And you're like, yeah, you have the confidence. Then after you do it, you're walking around like, oh no. And he's like, yeah, people are going to find out. And he's got you terrified that people are going to find out. That's the way the devil works because he just wants to keep you miserable. Don't compromise your I integrity. It causes stress. Take a little short-term pain for long-term peace. It's worth it. Proverbs 10.9 says, People with integrity have a firm footing. But those who follow crooked paths will slip and fall. Will slip. The fall is inevitable. It will definitely happen. What you sow, you will reap. What you send around, which goes around, comes around. You cheat, you'll get cheated. You're dishonest, somebody will be dishonest with you. Follow a crooked path and you will fall, this passage tells us. Did you follow the, are you following the presidential uh, elections at all? What happens is, somebody gets into the presidential race and what does the news media and the opponents do immediately? They do a deep dive and try to find out all the dirt, all the skeletons, everything possible on this person to use against them. Ben Carson spoke at my kid's graduation. By the way, Chanel's here. And it was her graduation and he spoke there and Luke's coming up next week. But this is what Ben Carson said. There is a desperation on behalf of some to try to find ways to tarnish me because they've been looking through everything. They've been talking to everybody I've ever known, everybody I've ever seen. There's got to be a scandal. There's got to be some nurse he had an affair with. There's got to be something. They have gotten desperate. Carson continued, next week, I'll be, it'll be my kindergarten teacher who said I peed in my pants. It's ridiculous, but it's okay because I totally expect it. And what I want you to expect is that the devil's going to do a deep dive on you when you think nobody's going to find out and you're tempted to do it. Don't do it. Don't do the short-term stress relief. Just go for the long-term peace by keeping your integrity and doing what's right. You'll live much more stress-free. And money is a, is a powerful thing in our lives as well. It's a dangerous area. This thing, greed, can be a powerful enemy. So even if you're upright in a lot of areas, when it comes sometimes to money, people weird out on it and, and, get, and lose their integrity. It goes out the window, their values when it comes to money. So a fundamental decision uh, we need to make is, am I going to follow the truth about money or am I going to just want money and whatever it takes, I'm going I'm to go for it. If you follow the truth, you're going to do the right thing, and that's the right thing to do. If you follow things, when it comes, push comes to shove, you're going to lie a little, you're going to cheat a little, you're going to try to get ahead by compromising your integrity. Don't do it. Keep your stress low, long term. Keep your stress low, long term. Oh, there's tons of examples. I, I won't go into them, but I just approved a life group in the church. And June Terachuk's here. She's the one who's going to lead it. June, I entitled your life group Women in Paradise. 
It's a women's breakfast group that meets once a, uh, once a month on a Saturday morning at Paradise Restaurant. So I entitled it Women in Paradise, once a month. If you want to know about the group, see June. But what happens there is the women get around breakfast, and they're tempted. We're all tempted. Jesus was tempted. But they start talking to one another, and the stress starts to come down. The temptation is exposed. There is courage, encouraging to one another in a small group setting, and it's beautiful, and it brings strength to, to walk in integrity. And so long term, you have less stress. So check that group out. It's wonderful. It's the First Life group approved under this new visioneering, this new revisioneering of the church. Excited. So we, if we're going to avoid the stress of a compromising situation, first of all, do the right thing. Second of all, trust God for your future. Have you ever seen somebody, maybe at work or somewhere, that's just doing so well and you know they're a liar, they're cheating, they're... They're just manipulating to get ahead. It kind of hits you in the gut, and you just get aggravated at that. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 17, Don't envy sinners, but always continue to fear the Lord, for surely you have a future ahead of you. Your hope will not be disappointment, disappointed. You see, the fact is this, and this is a very key fact. Judgment hasn't happened yet. Everybody's going to hit the wall of judgment at some point in their lives. God knows that. That's why God tells us, don't be envious of sinners that are prospering because they're cheating and they're doing all the... Don't envy them. I know what's ahead for them. And it's not good. You shouldn't be envious of them. But for you, you do the right thing. You keep everything you have in my hands and at the end, it'll be wonderful for you. It will be wonderful for you when you walk in integrity and not cheat. You know, the dictionary defines cheating, swindle, defraud, dupe, trick, fleece, con, take advantage of, built, bamboozle, hoodwink, rip off, and scam, and that's just a few. And they're out there. And we can be tempted when we look at people and we see them getting ahead to compromise our integrity. But don't envy cheaters or liars, even if they get wealthy and they're climbing the ladder. They don't have a future. They're going to hit the wall someday, and it's going to fall. It's not going to be pretty. But you, on the other hand, when you walk in your integrity and do right, you've got a wonderful future, even if you're broke. Can I hear an amen? Amen. <laughs> you see, God told Isaiah to do some hard stuff. He told Isaiah to go out and tell the people some hard stuff. And Isaiah didn't want to. He said, this is hard stuff, God. And the people didn't like what he said. They criticized him, but he did it. It was the right thing. And it was hard short term, but long term, he has a beautiful future, Isaiah. Can't wait to see him in heaven. He said in Isaiah 49, 4, I leave it all in the Lord's hands. Did you hear that? I leave it all in the Lord's hands. I will trust God for my reward. Sometimes as a leader, we get criticized. Sometimes when we do the right thing, we really get criticized. And let me tell you this. If you don't want to be criticized, then do absolutely nothing. But when you start doing good and you start standing for Jesus and you start walking in integrity, the criticisms are going to come. But that's all right. Keep it in the hands of God. Keep giving it into the hands of God. Whatever the stressor, whatever your situation is, we serve an audience of one. His name is Jesus. And some of you are doing the right thing in your marriage right now. And you're sticking it out and you're trying to do everything you can to make it work and make it be beautiful, but it's just not very good right now. Let me tell you this, keep it in God's hands. Just keep putting it in God's hands. You may be doing everything you can, and as best you know is apparent. And those little guys, it just doesn't seem like the happy ending has come yet. They're still a work in progress. Keep it in God's hands. Just keep putting it in God's hands. You may be an employee, and you may have done right, and you were ready for that promotion or ready for that raise, and it never came. You saw others who cheated and they got ahead. Listen, keep doing right. Keep it in God's hands. I'm going to read you a story. Lee, this is a guy named Lee. I'm an attorney, but I chose to work in the business world. Last January, I went to work for a new company. The new job offered me more responsibility and more authority and more money, more glamour, a shorter commute, and seemed to have greater career potential than where I had been. Shortly after I started there, though, I found myself involved in an ugly and complicated situation in which I was pressured to do things which were questionable morally and ethically. 
As I began to investigate this issue more, situation more, I found that the company had a history of unethical and even illegal conduct, at least in the office I was working in. There had been kickbacks and shakedowns and overbilling that probably rose to a level of fraud. My legal training and experience raised my concerns over these past practices and whether they still might be going on, but as soon as I began to ask questions, the tension and stress around me began to mount. I offered suggestions to my boss to address the conduct which I feared was completely out of control. He was not receptive at all. Instead, I felt alone and unsupported. The tension over all this seemed to increase daily. Ultimately, I was presented with the dilemma of compromising my ethical values or perhaps losing my job. Though I was tempted to take the easy way out, I now have Christ in my life, and I knew that integrity demanded that I do the right thing, not the easy thing. Before I became a believer, I had encountered other moral dilemmas, such as this one, but I had no spiritual resources to cope with them. In one similar situation, I agonized and suffered greatly over what I should do about it, but I didn't have the presence of the Lord, no support group, and no spiritual strength. I really felt torn apart by my dilemma at that time. The pressure and dissension that resulted was a huge factor in the breakup of my family and then divorce. It was a disaster. But because I had no sound basis for decisions and I didn't have the knowledge of Christ's love and guidance to see me through, when I was faced with one moral choice after another, I felt unable to maintain my integrity and my ability to trust anyone or any institution was almost destroyed. The web of compromise I was trapped in kept getting more and more tangled. Even though I knew what was right and I knew what I had to do, it took several years, the loss of my wife, serious economic disrup disruption, and a career change to get my attention. But recently now that I have trusted Christ with my life and now with my career, I was able to respond in an entirely different manner. In spite of the fact that my recent situation was pretty much the same, I was able to commit the situation and my future to God and to trust Him to care for me. Although I sought vigorously to maintain my job, my rights, and my integrity, and though I used all the legitimate tools I had available to me, I ultimately reached a dead end. When I refused to compromise on what I knew was right, I was forced to leave the company. Since making that choice, though, I've had so many blessings in my life. My belief in Romans 8.28 that God uses all things for the good of those who believe in Him has been reinforced and strengthened. I know for a certainty that that is true. I'm now married to a wonderful Christian woman, and together we've chosen to follow God's path. My wife and my small group have been supportive beyond anything I could have imagined. My small group has offered tremendous encouragement, and they and others have offered help in my search for new employment. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, knowing that is a great stress reliever. I just had a leadership conference where we're starting to develop these life groups and small groups so we can get around in small groups, and I'm starting to approve some of these groups as they are applying and getting ready to launch in the fall. I'm thinking of launching one in the fall. I'm entitling it Joined. For married and engaged couples, we want to do it for eight weeks, and what I want to look at is our personality differences and how that can cause some, some difficulties and, and how neither is bad, but how do you handle someone who's got a different personality than you in certain areas, for instance? Personality, you, you just don't change it. It's pretty steady. And I'm going to use the big five. These are standard. You're going to take an online test. It's going to be evaluated. Then we're going to sit down and look. It's not going to be personal. We're just going to talk about personalities. And so we're going to look at, and in the group, there's going to be certain people on all the extremes. One of the personality traits is organized. You see, because if you're organized and the person you're married to is very disorganized, or not, or let's say free, <laughs> in a positive way, because they just are, there's certain ways of supporting one another and learning how to blend. That's what we're going to go into. So if you want to be a part of that, it might have to be limited, but you can sign up. I put a sign-up sheet out there. I'm getting ready for September, and I think that's going to be a real blast. Um, so this guy honored God, absolutely. The potential stress of compromising situations. You do right, and you trust God with your situation. Secondly, conflicts. Conflicts can be very stressful. We're all wired up differently, and conflicts are never fun. They're always a pain 
Nobody likes them. We haven't really learned growing up from our parents or from school or from college how to handle conflicts. Nobody's ever taught us really, but the Bible teaches us. It's like a manual on conflicts. So whether you have conflict with your girlfriend or your mother or your friend or your boss, the Bible helps us. And so the first thing we want to do when we're having potential stress with conflicts, how to renew our mind, change your focus. Change your focus when you're in a conflict. We've got to develop a new habit. Now this is easy to say, but it might be really hard to do. We have to intentionally focus on the other person. We have to switch our minds and refocus to the other person's needs, their hurts, their wants, where they're coming from. We have to start, shut down us, me, 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 and start thinking about the other person. I'm preaching this, but I'm, this is not easy stuff. Conflict resolution starts with understanding where the other person's coming from. What are they actually saying? Am I listening to them? As soon as that understanding starts coming in, stress will start to go. Conflict will start to diminish. We have to understand their temperament, their personality, why they're weird and out right now. <laughs> What's their background? What's their values? What do they believe? Why are they acting like this? So we have to listen, we have to ask questions, start to communicate. Wives or husbands, if your spouse has stopped talking to you, it's probably not because there's a lot of peace in the house. It's not because they believe you're right. If they stop talking to you, it's probably because they believe you're not listening to them. And it's time to sit down and start asking some real questions and really listening, deep listening, and asking more questions. It's not always easy, but we've got we've to talk. What happens is we don't want to stop talking ourselves. We don't want to stop telling them how it is or telling them how we feel or telling them what we want. And when we, they start, we interrupt them and say, no, but we want, you know. And that just ups the ante and creates the conflict and demonstrates we really don't understand where that other, and we really don't care where that other person is. We only care about ourselves, my side. That's why we have the conflict. So God gave us, God shows us, he gave us what? One mouth, two ears, for a reason. Let everyone be quick to hear and slow to speak. Scripture says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out after your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. So whenever there's selfishness, that's the first reason we have conflict. Whenever there's pride, we're conceited, we think it's all about me, that's the second reason. But when those start to diminish, they walk out the door, a lot of resentment, anger, conflict goes right with them. Did you ever know you were wrong in an argument and you didn't want to quit? You're like, yeah, but you said this, and yeah, but this, and this, you know. And instead, you know what the good thing to say is? That was dumb. I'm sorry. I should have never said that. I was wrong in saying that. That goes a long way. Just stop. Just stop arguing. You want to reduce stress? Step into humility. It's an awesome thing. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't feel fun, but it's an awesome thing. <laughs> I'm not saying by humility that we're worthless or we're a doormat. I'm just saying that it, it's, it's not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking less about yourself and more of the other person. When we're in humility, it balances our thinking from me, me, me to me and you and you and just humility balances what we're thinking. Christ kind of gave up his rights so he can give us the right to become his children. And when we follow him, we kind of give up our rights too for the benefit of others. That's kind of tough, but he did that for us so, so we could be forgiven and he wants us to represent him. We have a hard time giving up our rights, but I want to say this, sometimes it's not our rights that, that are really rights. It's our wants. It's not really our rights a lot of times. It's our wants. For instance, is anybody warm in here? No, just me? All right, good. 
All right, we'll leave it alone. We might say, my right is to have a beautiful wife. Now, after some several children and after some several years, I deserve a beautiful wife. My wife's not taking care of herself, and I deserve a beautiful wife. Therefore, it, at the office is a bimbo. You know what a bimbo is? Definition of a bimbo? An attractive but empty-headed young woman, especially one perceived as a willing sex object. She dolls up. She's younger, and she uses that to attract uh, an older guy or whatever, however, whatever scenario, who thinks he deserves uh, a, a beautiful woman. And so there's an influence there. That's not a right. That's not even a want. That's a wrong. <laughs> Bimbo's wrong, and the guy is wrong. I hate, I mean, I love, my wife's beautiful, and I'm just like, oh, God, thank you. But, you know, no matter what, we stay and we love our wives, men. And for women, I deserve, I deserve a rich, I want to be supportive. I, I deserve a husband who brings home the bacon. And... You know, my husband hasn't been promoted in 20 years. What's the matter with you? You know, why can't you make money like others? You know, we're driving a crummy car. We're still living in this crummy place. You know, all on and on and on. I deserve a husband who makes a better income. Than, well, you know what a gold digger is? It's a person, a woman, who starts to build a relationship because she wants to just get, get the finances. It's not a right that's not even a want. That's a wrong. The rights we sometimes we think we have are just wants, and they're not even wants. They're wrongs. You shouldn't be thinking that way, really. And when we do, we're on the edge of creating a whole lot of stress for us. <laughs> These kinds of things of wants, thinking there are rights, like, I, I think I have the right to be unforgiving. I think I have the right to be vengeful. I think I have the right to not believe in God, to be moody, to be grouchy, uh, to be uncooperative, to be crude, to, to cuss, to, you know, I think I have these rights. I can do what I want. They're not rights. They're not even wants. They're wrongs a lot of times. And if we want to reduce our conflicts in our lives, let's give up these wrongs that we think are rights, and they're not right at all. There are legitimate rights we have. Let's carefully evaluate what they are before we insist on them. Only God can meet a lot of our needs. Let's not put that on everybody else. And so just take some time. Reevaluate what your real rights are, what, what really you are expecting of other people, or you could go through life incredibly conflicted with people. Let me read a story of Steve and Dina. Steve. We're a step family. That's the first thing we tell you because, frankly, it's a big part of our lives. We have a passion for helping step families stay together and grow and thrive as Christ-centered families. We know from firsthand experience that being in a step family can be stressful. In any family, the opportunity often comes in the form of conflict. But in a step family, we get an extra opportunity for this type of growth because we have additional sources of conflict such as dealing with ex-spouses or learning to relate to children who are not biologically our own. We're faced with difficult choices all the time, like how do you respond when your ex-spouse tears you down to your children? Do you retaliate? And how do you handle a teenager telling you, you're not my dad, you can't tell me what to do? Do you respond self-defensively or do you try to force your authority? Only with God's help are we able to keep our head in these type of situations. Dina. I'd like to be able to say that whenever we have a conflict, we immediately turn to God, but we usually don't. We usually run around in circles for a while first and try to figure it out ourselves. As a result, there's been many times for both Steve and I when our emotional tanks have just been empty and we have nothing left inside ourselves to deal with our conflict or our circumstances. Steve, one way we try to keep our thinking clear during these conflicts and stress is by being very deliberate about our growth. That includes our personal growth and growing in our marriage and also our parenting skills. 
Everyone knows that divorce rate is high in America, but it's even higher for step families. 65 to 85 percent of step families end up divorcing again. The odds are stacked against you. So we decided early on that we need regular outside input in order to keep our family on track. We've taken many seminars on communication and parenting skills based on biblical principles. We've budgeted funds every month to see a Christian counselor on a regular basis indefinitely. Proverbs 13.10 says, Pride only leads to arguments, but those who take advice are wise. So some of the best money we've ever spent has been on Christian counselors who have helped us learn better conflict resolution skills. One of the most helpful skills that we're learning is the importance of controlling how we talk to each other during these conflicts. For example, we have agreed that there are certain conflict rules in our home. We are committed that no matter how heated an argument gets, we will not bring up divorce. This is taboo. We also don't sink to the level of name-calling or demeaning each other or public humiliation. We don't let our anger turn into disrespect or verbal attacks. Proverbs 15.1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs of anger. We're also learning to really listen to each other, not just to push to be heard. Dina. Even with these commitments in place, over time I find myself falling into some of the same old patterns and contributed to the demise of my first marriage. And so did Steve. During one particularly mature argument, I got so frustrated that I threw a bag of bagels at Steve. It's a good thing bagels are soft. But still, on my wedding day, I never pictured beating my husband with a bag of bagels. But I brought myself with me into this marriage with many of the same hang-ups I already had. And the first step for both of us was admitting that our bad habits and hang-ups hadn't been cured by divorce and remarriage. This has been especially helpful in the area of parenting, which is the number one cause of divorce among stepfamilies. Steve. A third big help in helping our thinking uh, to be clear has been the small group we belong to. Our small group of friends is so important to us. It's one of the greatest sources of strength and support for us. I just can't tell you how many times they've kept us directed and focused on trusting God when we were right in the middle of chaos. They prayed for us, strengthened our marriage through accountability and honesty. They have even helped us financially when we were in a very sudden money crisis. At other times, we've been able to help them. Our small group is very much like a family to us, and since we've all been through the same experience of divorce and remarriage, we carry many of the same burdens, and we can also share them. We support each other and keep each other accountable in the highly charged, emotional situations that can definitely hit stepfamilies. Dina. Whether you're in the ideal traditional family or you're in a stepfamily, you're going to have conflict caused by different kinds of stress. Jobs get downsized, teenagers get into trouble, parents get sick, and need care, and everyone reacts differently. So conflict is an inevitable part of life, but with God's help, and God's word, and the support of our small group, our stress level has become much more manageable. So we talked about this principle in lowering conflict to focus on the other person, and then what we hear here in this story is to watch your words. The words you speak can hurt and can mortally wound people around you. They are very powerful. Proverbs 18.20 says, You will have to live with the consequences of everything you say. It's not good enough that you just say, Oh, I didn't know what I just was, I just didn't know what I was thinking, I just lost. No. That could stay with a person a long time. We have to be very careful with the words we speak. And again, personality differences. If you feel you could be benefited by joining this fall, you know, sit in there. Let's learn what it is, what differences, and how to use them for good. There's this uh, arsenal called MAD Weapons, M-A-D, Mutually Assured Destruction. During the Cold War, Russia and U.S., Mutually Assured Destruction. In other words, if they press the button, the red button for nuclear missiles coming over, we press the button going over, we mutually destroy one another. The world as we know it is gone forever. One button. I want us to think like that when we're in a battle or in a, in a disagreement with our spouse especially, but with anybody. Our words count. Our words can mutually destroy. And so let's be careful. The Bible says don't use foul or abusive language. 
Let every, everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement. Get rid of all the bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Certain words are absolutely taboo. Don't use them. No matter how mad we get, those words never get the point across. They just bring us backwards. And we can commonly say, just stop and say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. So lastly, the stress of competition. We talked about the stress of compromise, the stress of conflict, and now I want to close with this, the stress of competition. We're in Connecticut. You know, I would have to say in Connecticut, we're not like L.A. or New York that we're really competitive about designer clothes or hairstyles. You all look very nice. I'm not jealous of any one of you. I mean, I don't think about your anything like that. I don't think we do that. You know what our, stre you know what our stress, you know what our competition is in Connecticut? It's to survive. We're all just trying to survive. And in, and in uh, a capitalist, um, capitalistic society, we've been raised up to be competitive and that, hey, either we get ahead or you get ahead. We're on, we're, who's on top here? And we have this kind of ingrained in us and we constantly have this stress to perform just to survive. Anybody with me on that? Yeah. So how do you reduce this kind of stress of competition Number one, stop comparing ourselves to others. Just stop comparing. It could be our favorite indoor sport, just comparing. Kids, cars, jobs, all the rest. It's foolish. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. And so I want to say you are unique. You are custom designed. You have designer genes. God designed them. God doesn't want you to be anybody else but you. The world would be at a loss if you were like somebody else and you weren't you, the God made, that God made. Some people start off as originals and they end up as carbon copies. God wants tremendous variety. That's why he made us all different. So be you. And don't be afraid to be you. And I want to say, you weren't an accident. I am extremely pro-life. I am for your life. No matter how you were conceived, no matter whether you had parents or not, I am incredibly pro-life. I am for your life from the moment you were conceived until now because I believe no matter how you were conceived, no matter what happened in your life, you were not an accident. God formed you, knit you together, and brought you forth because he uniquely designed you to be here. And I love him for that, and I love you for that. And when we start comparing ourselves, we start competing. Start comparing, start competing. Be very careful with that. Because there's always going to be somebody better, and it's pretty discouraging. <laughs> you know, you go on Facebook and you're like, oh man, they look like, oh, they're having a you know, good time. You know, it's like, oh, forget it. <laughs> don't compare wives, husbands. Wives, don't compare husbands. I'll tell you what, you know, you come up to my wife and say, man, I'm really, you know, uh, you know envious of you. You have a great husband. She'd say, take him. <laughs> take him. You try him out. <laughs> you know, it's not all it looks like. It's cracked up to be. And the same with a job. That other person, wow, they got a great job. You did their job for a while, you'd be like stressing. It's like, oh, keep that job. But we're always looking at something else and we're causing ourselves stress. Be unique. Don't torture yourself. It's good to be you. Can you say it with me? It's good to be me. One, two, three. It's good to be me. Let's admit that. God made me me and that's okay. That's the way he wanted. That's why he did it. Let's say it again. It's good to be me. That's right. Um, you're unique, and when we compare ourselves to each other, it, it, it makes us miserable. You know the fastest way to depreciate your car is for your neighbor to get a new one. <laughs> the Bible says, pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. You don't have to be the best. You just have to do your best. When you get in heaven, God's not going to say, were you the best? He's going to say, did you do your best? And that's about it. 
Well, I've got to close up here. But I, I want you to remember God's unconditional love here when it comes to comparing yourself, that he doesn't base it on performance. When do you think God started loving you? When you cleaned up your act? We still haven't cleaned up our act. When we stop sinning, we still can't, you know, we still mess up. God loved you from the beginning. While we were yet sinners, he, he went to the cross and died for us. He, he loves us. He demonstrated his love for us way back then. Guy went to the, and I'll have the worship team come. Guy died, went to the gates, met St. Peter. This is a joke. It's not the way it's going to be. But, uh, and so he said, okay, what do I have to do to get into heaven? Peter said, you've got to get 100 points to get into heaven. So the guy said, all right, let's start. And he said, all right, what would you do for work? I worked with Mother Teresa for the poor in Indian for 20 years. And Peter said, okay, that's one point. He goes, one point? It was 20 years. Yeah, one point. What else did you do? I raised six kids. They're missionaries all over the world, bringing people to the Lord. And, and St. Peter said, all right, that's one point. One point? And so he said, yeah, well, what else did you do? He said, I left all my inheritance to feed the poor and take care of charities. And Peter said, eh, that's one point. That's all I got. That's three points. I need a hundred points. <laughs> I'll never make it. All I've got is the grace of God. Bingo. We'll never make it. It's not our performance. It's His grace. It's His goodness. And that we can bank on. <laughs> so, I guess I've got to close and get moving. I got that handout. Make sure you all signed up for that. I hope you all get into a small group in uh, September. But, and I'm going to be telling you more about them, approving groups as we go. So we can lower our stress when we're in a big setting like this and then when we're in a small group. Right now you can attend Wednesday night and June's group. And, and, uh, and I just want this life to be good for you. I want to go to heaven with you. So I'm going to ask you to just bow your hearts. Let me pray. Father, I'm sure that there are people that you specifically brought here today because they're caught in a compromising situation and the stress is killing them. I know that there are other people here today who are caught in the middle of a major conflict and they're tired and they're worn out. I know that there are still others here that are feeling exhausted and drained from the competitive rat race of always trying to perform better and better and get more done and make more happen and be number one. Thank you, Lord, for every one of these people. I know that you love every one of them very much. Help them today to let go. Let go. Let go and trust you and find relief this morning. And you may want to follow me in this prayer just in the silence of your heart. Regardless of the cause of your stress, uh, just follow me in this prayer if you want. Dear God, you see all the stress in my life. You know the parts that I brought on myself and you know the parts that other people have caused. I want to give both parts to you today. Thank you for loving me unconditionally. Today I commit to following these practical steps from your word. When I'm in a compromising situation, I want to do the right thing. I want to trust you to provide for my future needs and not worry about it. When I have conflict with other people, help me to watch my words and look at the situation from their side. Bring healing to the conflict I'm in right now. Forgive me for always looking around and comparing myself to other people. I'm sorry. I know you made me unique and you have a plan for my life. So Jesus, today I accept your unconditional love and we pray this in your wonderful name, Lord. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you as I head over to the other campus. And we'll go into worship a little bit here. And I will see you soon again. God bless you. you could